I couldn't help but think last night, as Dr. Wisby said, that walking across this building was like going through two time zones, that it reminded me of the story of an Indian out in New Mexico. He had a girlfriend who lived a little distance away, and he wasn't very well off. He couldn't afford to go and see her very often, and he found postage rather expensive and telephoning out of the question. So he decided to resurrect the old custom of his people of speaking by smoke signals. And uh, he used to get out and send up these messages to his fiancée down the way with these smoke signals. It caught on in that part of the state and by and by everybody was doing it in the Indian community. They're sending these smoke signals up talking to each other and it became a pastime of an evening to sit out there and watch. And, see what people were saying one to another. About that time Uncle Sam exploded the first uh, test atomic bomb and this enormous mushroom cloud went up. And the Indian said, wow, he said, wish I'd said that. <laughs> now let's turn please to Psalm 24. This psalm was written by David to commemorate the return of the sacred Ark of the Covenant to the city of Jerusalem. For seven months the Philistines had kept it under lock and key but they finally decided it was too hot to hold and they sent it back where it belonged. It had resided at a place called Kirjaf Jirim on the western border of Benjamin in the rugged wooded highlands during the days of Samuel and Saul. David uh, had made one disastrous attempt to bring it back to Jerusalem. But now the time had come and he's now going to do God's work God's way. He wrote a number of Psalms to commemorate the event, Psalm 132, Psalm 68, Psalm 87 and Psalm 24. And the historian tells us how David proceeded the procession with the priests coming behind carrying the ark upon their shoulders. And David leaping and dancing before the Lord with all his might. I think this psalm gives us a picture of what happened. As the parade approaches the great city, they see it sitting up there on high, crown, crowning the mighty hills of Judah. And the choir begins to sing. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And David, dancing before the Lord with all his might, bursts into song and he says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? And again the choir picks up the theme and they answer the question of the king, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation that seek him, that seek thy face, O God of Jacob, Selah. By the way, you know what that little word Selah means. It simply means there. What do you think of that? <laughs> Presently the king and the priests and the choir and the rejoicing people arrive at the top of the hill and they stand before the massive gates of the city and David cries as he lifts up his voice in song, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. The sentinel within the gate replies, who is this king of glory? 
And David answers, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. The gates do not open and so the whole choir picks up the demand. Lift up your head, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And once again the sentinel at the gate asks the ceremonial question, who is this King of glory? And now the king, backed by the whole choir, thunders out, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory, Selah. What do you think of that? <laughs> this lovely little psalm divides into three parts. In verses 1 and 2, we have the Lord's claim. In verses 3 to 6, we have the Lord's call. And in verses 7 to 10, we have the Lord's coming. Now here is the Lord's claim. He says the earth is the Lord's. Now you understand of course that our Lord's ultimate territorial claims in space embrace very much more than that. All the vast stellar empires belong to him. He sits upon his throne gazing out across the vastness of space. He sees countless stars and their satellites traveling at inconceivable velocities upon prodigious orbits blazing their light trails across the velvet blackness of the night and the roaring thunder of their praise echoes and re-echoes around his throne. And they all belong to him. But as he sits there upon his throne gazing out across the vastness of his creation there, one, one amid a hundred million galaxies, he picks out one galaxy. We call it the Milky Way. It's our galaxy. He picks out that one. He watches this galaxy of ours, a hundred billion stars in the form of a giant disk spinning around the center. And there about a hundred thousand light years away from the center of the galaxy, he picks out just one star. We call it the sun. It's hurrying across the vastness of space, hurrying around the hub of its universe. It's given birth to some baby planets and they too are scurrying across space. And he watches as the sun and its little family hurry to make their orbit around the center of the galaxy about once every 200 million years. And he picks out just that one star in that one galaxy. And then he picks out one planet. We call it the planet Earth. And he says, that one is mine. C.S. Lewis, in one of his books, calls it the silent planet. He pictures all the stars of space making merry music to their maker as they swing around his throne. All except one tiny planet. It has no song. It's quarantined. It's diseased. We call it the planet Earth. C.S. Lewis called it the silent planet. I don't think I'd call it the silent planet. I think I'd call it the sobbing planet. It's really filled with din and noise and screams and cries of agony and pain. 
And yet the Lord picks out this one little tiny planet in space, the sobbing planet, and he says, that one belongs to me. The Earth, planet Earth, is the Lord's. We wonder why he should even bother. After all, our world is such a puny little place compared with the vastness of the universe, just a microscopic speck of cosmic dust. So small relative to the vastness of the universe that only the eye of omniscience could even see it. But he says, that one is mine. Why should he bother? Well, I'd like to give you a little illustration, but I have to give you a page from English history. I'm very, very happy to give you a page of American history, uh, but they never taught it where I went to school. <laughs> we didn't know you had any. <laughs> And we didn't like what we knew anyway. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Let me give you a page from English history. I don't suppose you know before that Sunday morning, January the 18th, year 1815, that anybody had ever heard of a place called Waterloo. Waterloo was just a little tiny village in the Empire of France. It was so small it was hardly worth putting on the map. And yet it was there on that Sunday morning in the year 1815 that the armies of the Iron Duke of Wellington met and mastered the armies of Napoleon and changed the course of history for all the rest of time. So you see, Waterloo assumes an importance in the thinking of the historian out of all proportion to its size. Actually, its size has nothing to do with it. It's important because of what happened there. And that's why this world is important to God has nothing to do with its physical size which is totally immaterial to a God who is infinite. This world is important to God because of what happened here. You know sin did not begin on earth, it began in heaven. It did not begin with Adam and Eve, it began in the heart of the anointed cherub the choir master of heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning. But before ever the mystery of iniquity raised its head in the universe in a dateless, timeless past, before ever the rustle of an angel's wing disturbed the silence of eternity, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit decided that when the mystery of iniquity raised its head in the universe, they would bring it to a head and settle it once and for all upon a place called planet Earth. <laughs> Satan didn't know about that. <laughs> Little did he know that when he invaded our planet from outer space and tempted our first parents and dragged them down into sin and imported the mystery of iniquity to this particular spot in space. Little did he know that he had fallen into an ambush which had been set for him before ever time began. If he'd known that he'd have stayed away from this place. And so this little world of ours spins through space, chasing around the sun, carrying its human load of guilt and sin, throbbing on its agonizing way, one colossal graveyard, but it has not been abandoned. It's been chosen. 
And so the Lord announces to the universe. He says the earth is the Lord's. That's the Lord's claim. And then we have the Lord's call. You see, it is absolutely true that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That he owns every nook and cranny, owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. North and south, east and west, the whole earth belongs to him. But there is one spot upon this planet to which he lays special claim, and that's the land of Israel. The Arabs uh, say it belongs to them. It doesn't belong to them at all, it belongs to him. It's called his land. When you come into the land of Israel to which he lays special claim, you discover again that there is one place to which he lays special claim, and that's the city of Jerusalem. It's called the city of the great king. It's his. The United Nations says it's an international city. It's not an international city at all, it's his city, it belongs to him. Well, when you come into the city of Jerusalem, you discover from this psalm that there are two places to which he lays special claim. One is called the hill and one is called the holy place. The hill is Mount Zion, crowned in David's day by the great Jebusite fortress. Sometimes called the citadel of David, it stands for all the dynamics of secular power. He who held the hill held the city. He who held the city held the country. He who held the country held, holds the world. And so the hill, Mount Zion, stands for all the dynamics of secular power. The holy place was Mount Moriah where soon the temple was to be built, a place already of sacred memories dating right back a thousand years to Abraham and Isaac, the holy place. And if the hill stands for all the dynamics of secular power, then the holy place stands for all the dynamics of spiritual power. Now here's the Lord's call, he says, who wants to have a share in the crowning day that's coming by and by? Who wants to have a share in the day of my glory? In everything that happens on the hill and everything that happens in the holy place. Who would like to have a share in all the dynamics of secular power and spiritual power in that day? Oh, I say that's quite an offer. <laughs> I'd rather go in for that than to go in for being President of the United States, let me tell you. You remember on one occasion when the Lord lived down here on earth, that his two closest disciples, James and John, with their mother, Mrs. Zebedee, came to see him. The Lord saw them coming, of course, and he knew exactly what he was going to be asked. And it's not very long before Mrs. Zebedee comes out with it. She says, Lord, she says, please, in the day of your glory, when you sit upon your throne, when you reign from the river to the ends of the earth, when you sway your scepter over river, sea, and shore, when you come into your kingdom, Lord, I... I should like to request that my two sons, James and John, that one should sit on your right hand and the other on your left. Well, you know, that really was a very noble request. 
Would God indeed that every mom and dad had this as their supreme ambition for their boys and their girls that in the day of his glory their children might sit on his right hand and on his left hand in his kingdom. What a noble request. The Lord Jesus looked at her and he said, I'm very sorry, uh, Mrs. Zebedee, very sorry. Request denied. You see, that was not his to give. That had to be earned. And this is how it's earned, you see. He shall be, he'll be looking for three things. Christ, likeness of life. He says, who shall ascend, who shall stand, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands, that's your outward life. A pure heart, that's your inward life. And he joins the hands and the heart together because we do what we do because we are what we are. Christ likeness of life. And Christ likeness of longing. Who shall ascend, he says, who shall stand, he that hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Who does that remind you of? It reminds me of Solomon in his old age. Do you know Solomon did more to destroy the nation of Israel than any other king who ever sat upon the throne of David. He started so well but made such terrible shipwreck along the way and sowed wreckage and ruin into his nation. God came to him one day, he'd been down in the valley of Jehinnom and he had been looking at the things that were going on down there, even an altar to Moloch. They took their little babes and Moloch was a terrible idol. It had a hollow interior and they would fire it up with flaming hot faggots of wood until the whole of, of Moloch glowed in the furnace and they would take little babies and they would place them on the red hot lap of Moloch. Imagine. You know by the time Solomon had finished with Jerusalem he turned it into Babylon. And God came to him and he said if it wasn't for your father's sake I'd do it now but for your father's sake I'll wait until you're dead but I'm going to tear your kingdom in pieces and I see Solomon as he sits down and he picks up a copy of the Hebrew hymn book and he starts to read the 39th Psalm and one word leaps out of the page it's the word vanity vanity it really means you know chasing the wind and all of a sudden it dawned upon Solomon that he had thrown away an empire and a crown by chasing the wind and living for the wrong world. Who shall ascend? Who shall stand? He that hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. The kind of person who doesn't live for the wrong world. Christ likeness of life and Christ likeness of longings and Christ likeness of language he says who shall ascend who shall stand he that hath not sworn deceitfully for God is looking for men and women who are absolutely dependable utterly trustworthy whose word is their bond and who when they say I'll do it they do it no matter how inconvenient it eventually becomes and when they say they'll do it, they do it for the simple reason that once having given their word, it would not occur to them not to do it. Not sworn deceitfully. 
And so we have the Lord's claim and we have the Lord's call. And the rest of the psalm is concerned with the Lord's coming. Five times in the closing verses, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks of the Lord Jesus as the King of glory. Twice he issues the challenge that the gates of glory be lifted up. Twice the question is asked, who is this King of glory? Once the answer given is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Once the answer given is quite different, it's the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now why do you think the Holy Spirit records twice the asking of the question, who is this King of glory? And the answer given is different on each occasion. I mean, there's got to be some reason for that. In order to understand the reason for that, we have to put things in their proper perspective. The Lord Jesus stepped out of eternity into time. He clothed himself in human flesh and lived amongst us down here for 33 and a half years. And during that period of time, he won victory after victory over the world and the flesh and the devil. Every form of temptation was pressed upon him and presented to him. Satan tested him and tried him with the three great primeval and prevalent temptations of the human race, the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, but it was all in vain. He was the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Satan had him betrayed and manhandled and mauled. He had him scourged to the bone and crowned with thorns and took him out to Calvary's hill and nailed him to a cross of wood and they gathered around to mock him while he died. And all of a sudden it seems Satan realized his mistakes because he urged him to come down from the cross. It's all in vain, you know. It was the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He defeated Satan every time, not once in thought or word or deed, whether as a babe or as a child or as a teenager or as a man, whether in the home or in the classroom or in the synagogue or at the workbench or treading the highways and byways of his native land, never once did Satan succeed in winning even so much as the ghost of a victory. He was the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty and badly tried to get at him once through his mother he tried to get at him in cunning verbal encounter bringing the best brains of the country up against him it's all in vain you know the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle when it was all over they took him down from the cross and they placed him in joseph's tomb and rolled the stone against the door and all the might of imperial Rome put its seal upon that tomb. It was all in vain. Vainly they seal the dead. Jesus my Savior, vainly they watch his bed. Jesus my Lord, up from the grave he arose mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. He was the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He stayed around for 40 days appearing here and appearing there and then having proved himself alive by many infallible proofs he gathered up that little band of excited disciples and marched with them out through the gates of the city down across the valley of the Kedron up past the garden of Gethsemane and on up to the brow of the Mount of Olives 
And then he raised his hands in parting benediction and began slowly and majestically to ascend toward the sky. You know, so, signif so significant is that event that there are 20 distinct references it to it in the Gospels and the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit uses 13 different words and expressions to describe it, each one reflecting a different shade of meaning. The stunned disciples stood there watching in amazement as their Lord began to ascend toward the sky. The last thing they saw was the print of the nails in the soles of his feet. Then the cloud came and wrapped him around and they saw him no more. They didn't see what happened next. But David, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit a thousand years before, he saw what happened next. The Lord Jesus ascended the star road to glory, arrived before the pearly gates of the celestial city. He stood there and he said, lift up your head. O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. The watcher at the gate looked through and he saw a man standing there in a battered human body. He said, who is this King of glory? <laughs> the Lord Jesus showed his pierced hands and wounded side and he said the Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle he is the king of glory they opened the gates and let him in and he went down hallelujah avenue past amen square along hosanna highway and up past Beulah boulevard until he came to the throne of God and then he sat down at God's right hand in heaven. Most astounding fact in the history of the universe that is a man in a human body like yours and mine sitting on the throne of God in heaven and has every right to be there for he's God over all blessed forevermore. Amen. Now between verse 8 and verse 9 you have to put the entire church age. Uh, David didn't know that. But the Holy Spirit did. And during this long period of time, the Lord Jesus has been sitting on his Father's throne in heaven, and the Holy Spirit has been down here calling out to people for his name, and that third member of the Godhead has been gathering them together from every kindred and people and tribe and tongue. Sometimes by the thousands in times of revival and sometimes in ones and twos. Here a child at mother's knee, there an old man with one foot already in the grave. It's already a multitude that no man can number. A glorious church, heaven born and heaven bound, rooted in eternity, spread out through all time and space, glorious as an army with banners. And all this long time the Lord Jesus has been sitting on his Father's throne in heaven, watching with the keenest interest as the Holy Spirit has gone infallibly about his great task. And you can see him sitting there watching. And the invitation is given and somebody gets up and comes forward. And the Lord Jesus says to his father, here comes another one. <laughs> <laughs> or a little child responds in such a simple way to mother's presentation of the story of Jesus. And the Lord Jesus says to his father, here comes another one. He's been seeing of the travail of his soul and he is so satisfied. One of these days the very last one is going to come. And then the father is going to say to his son, now son, go and get him. And he'll get up off his father's throne in heaven and he'll come down the stairs but star-spangled splendor of the sky and he'll
burst into the environs of our planet and he'll say arise my love my fair one and come away and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in clouds to meet the Lord in the air and he'll put himself at the head of this enormous multitude of people this countless multitude of those who have been washed in his blood and whose names have been written down in heaven and who have been baptized by his Holy Spirit into the mystical body of Christ and we'll follow him way back up until we stand with him outside the gates of glory and he'll say Lift up your head, O ye gates. And the King of Glory shall come in. And the sentinel at the gate will look through and he'll see him standing there. And all this enormous multitude of men and women, boys and girls. And he'll say, who is this King of Glory? And he'll say, the Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory. And he'll open the gates <laughs> and in we'll go, we'll go down Hallelujah Avenue and past Amen Square and along Hosanna Highway and past Beulah Boulevard and till we come to the very throne of God. And he'll say they're all here, Father. <laughs> Haven't lost one of them. And then the Lord Jesus will sit himself down upon his father's throne and he said, now gather around my friends. He'll say, now we're going back. <laughs> He'll say, you see friends, the moment our back was turned, all hell was let loose down on that planet. And we're going to go back and put an end to it. Yeah. And I'm going to need some people to help me run an empire. I'm going to get up off the throne of my father in heaven and I'm going to go down there and sit upon the throne of my father David. And I'm going to need people to help me run an empire. Gather round my friends, let me look at your hands. And let me see your heart. Tell me, my friend, which world did you live for? Were you one of those people I could trust? Selah.